So, uh, just so everybody knows, this is my first talk. So if I'm a little jittery here, um, I have a track record of getting nervous. Uh, and by getting nervous, I mean that the last time I spoke in front of an audience, it was uh, being the best man at my brother-in-law's wedding. And my speech was literally two sentences long. I don't remember the first part pretty much because I was intoxicated, but the second part I get reminded of all the time and it's hopefully it lasts, which, yeah, doesn't work out well when I go to family events. <laughs> Do you want, you want me to have a drink? You think, got anything to put in this? All right, so the, the title of this talk is Deploying Honeypots to Gather Actionable Threat Intelligence. About me, my name is James Taliento. I am the research officer, principal consultant, and founder of uh, Cynical Security. As you can tell by the, the, the number of hats I wear, we're a very, very large company. Uh, education and certs, someone told me that I needed to put that on there, but I really don't think that anybody cares. Um, and at Twitter, uh, if you want to tweet at me or follow me, I, I'll give you a fair warning, I automate most of my tweets. Uh, there, there's nothing that interesting, I'm more of a lurker. Uh, but that's my name, just in case. All right. And I am from Long Island. There's not many people in here. Uh, I was going to ask you if anybody in here is from Long Island, but is that even the case? Hmm? I talk about Long Island. You talk funny. So you, when you say Long Island, it's like that? Yeah. It sounds like Long Island. That's like the way my mother and my wife say it. But I predicted nobody was going to say it. All right, so just to give you a little backstory, uh, over the past year, I had the opportunity to work with a number of new security products, uh, mainly in the areas of advanced threat protection, which is sandboxing and also uh, threat emulation, and then also with cyber threat intelligence products from about seven of the largest security product manufacturers out there. Um, these tests were done, approved by the manufacturer, uh, the scope was very, very limited for reasons I will not disclose, but I'm sure you can use your imagination as to why that is the case. Um, so long story short, I became very fascinated by how these products actually worked. Uh, and I would, I would oftentimes learn from the engineers at these companies themselves uh, that these products, all the components of them are available out there, and they're very, very accessible, and in most cases, free. Uh, in, in most cases, they actually harness the power of open source software and, and technologies. Uh, the notion of threat intelligence, uh, you, there's always a notion of uh, data collection when it comes to threat intelligence, which is usually collected by honeypots, which are deployed all over the world. Um, if you purchase a, a security product a threat intelligence security product, um, it is actually collecting data in some format on your network. It comes in the form of either a physical appliance or a virtual appliance. They try to be cost effective, I guess, to sell many. Um, the products themselves, they collect, process, and disseminate. Uh, and honeypots, in general, have always interested me. So over the years, I've tested a variety of honeypots, mainly in a pen test lab for experimentation. Um, I wanted to see what it looked like on the other side. So if I was doing, if I was trying out a new tool or technique, I would uh, try them out on a honeypot in conjunction with using some monitoring software, uh, mainly when I was testing out different evasion techniques. And that was really like the extent of my honeypot experience. Uh, but, while all this brain activity is going on, uh, a good friend and client of mine he took, recently took over a very large uh, infrastructure. He's the chief technology officer at a, a decent-sized organization. They have about 2,500 users on-prem, 2,500 users remote, um, and just to say that the, the, the infrastructure itself is a complete mess. Um, so he's going through this whole revamp, a whole overhaul of, of their network, and he's noticing, uh, you know, quite a few incidents arising, varying level of severity, but it's enough to allow panic to set in. So, of course, he approaches the officers of his company, and the same panic doesn't set in with them. Uh, 
more so because they didn't want to make the financial investment to Im improve their security program. So he came to me, and him and I kind of brainstormed, and we said, oh, well, you know what? We, I learned a little bit in the past over the last year about these different products. Why don't we try using honeypots to uh, you know, kind of build our own, at least network-level intelligence program? So his environment uh, became my playground over the last few months. And this talk is really a culmination of my experience with the commercial products uh, and their translation into the DIY approach of, of uh, threat intelligence. This talk is not advanced. Most of the technologies that I'm going to discuss you either know about or have used, but it's more about the application and the process of, uh, of threat intelligence data collection. Um, and the aim is really for you to leave here and just think creatively as to what you can do to build your own program. Um, yeah. Okay. So, what this talk is about. Very plainly, you need threat intelligence that actually pertains to you and that is actionable. I mean, it relates to your organization. It's something you can act upon. Um, honeypots, high interaction in particular, are how you're going to collect that information and then how you are going to do it, how you're going to implement these honeypots in your environment. Why? Uh, threat intelligence products overall are very expensive. Uh, some of those product suites range well into the six-figure mark, and it's you know not attainable to most organizations unless you're at the enterprise level. Um, you know your organization's risks better than any third party, uh, so relying on a product to do everything for you isn't necessarily the best approach, and doing the DIY route, although it's labor-intensive, uh, it does give you a little more insight as to what's going on. Improve response efforts by prioritizing threats as they relate to your organization. Again, uh, you know your organization's risks better than anyone else, so therefore you're more equipped to pri prioritize them. Okay, so of course I have to have a disclaimer. Uh, this was done for research purposes only and with the expl explicit permission of the organizations uh, used throughout the course of this research. I mentioned one organization in particular that I worked with. Um, that's pretty much because they gave me full gamut. Uh, everybody else was a little reluctant for legal reasons and they didn't really want to you know, deploy honeypots all over their network. Um, so what is presented here is based upon the facts and findings of the research conducted. Uh, these are just my observations. I'm by no means an expert in this space. Um, it was just more of a learning experience. And do not take legal advice from me. I am undoubtedly the, I would be the worst attorney. I have the worst poker face. Um, yeah, I exercise due diligence the best I can. I consulted legal. Uh, I tried to act ethically. I read as much as I can, but I could be teetering on the border there. Okay, so just a basic generic outline, very high level. Uh, we're going to talk about threat intelligence. What is it? The good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, specifically focus on data collection and then correlation. Um, we're going to talk about honeypots, which, again, many of you probably are very familiar with the concept of honeypots. Uh, types of, effective use of different considerations for different implementations, and then just brush up on what canaries are and how they can be used. Okay, so this is my own definition of what is threat intelligence. Uh, correlation of data mined from a variety of sources that can be used to predict threats. So intelligence is the sum of data plus analysis. And I broke it down into three core phases. If you ever have any experience with these products or if you've ever worked with any of these um, product manufacturers, they have their own range of phases of, as to how the product itself works. But, you know, if you, you know, process of deduction here, um, these are the three core phases of threat intelligence. There are, uh, there's collection where you're getting all your data from. Uh, there's the processing, which is making the data readable, putting it in a format that it can be, um, disseminated, and then there is dissemination, which is determining which, what data is actually useful. So, the good. It provides insight by improving visibility into your organization. 
you can't protect against something if you're not aware it exists. Um, you'll also learn a lot about your, your infrastructure going through this process if you do go the DIY route. Uh, results typically in improved detection and response times. Um, again, a lot of the analysis is cut out uh, because of the usage of tools, so you can respond quicker and detect threats earlier. And this last bullet uh, relates purely to commercial products. Um, shrink wrap products cut out all of the work. Uh, the data that you look at is the final product once the analysis is done, so they cut out pretty much all the steps and package it up. The bad products are expensive, that's why you're here. Some are good and some products just have good marketing. Uh, with that being said, some of the commercial products out there are really, really good. Um, most are not. And, you know, threat intelligence being the buzzword of 2014, 2015, uh, it's kind of like an arms race. Everybody's creating these products and rushing them to market and you'll see a lot of, a lot of noise in the data. They don't work very well. They're very buggy. They don't function the way they tell you they do. Um, and that's something that you'll find as a commonality amongst all of them. Uh, and the ugly, the DIY approach is very time consuming and may require additional technical resources. Um, as I explained this process to my friend at this organization, uh, you know, I said we might have to ask for additional help. I'm not a master of all things. I know enough to be dangerous and I think that anybody conducting any kind of research or, or doing any DIY would, uh, would agree there. All right, so let's talk about collection, which is the first phase. Uh, data is collected from uh, mainly four different sources. So inside your organization, which is classified as internal uh, intelligence, you have network intelligence, which is what we're talking about today. That's the scope of this talk. Um, the internet or edge intelligence, and then open source lists, which are available and are very good, actually. Okay, so where you can get network data, uh, it's pretty straightforward. You're probably doing some kind of uh, log management or, or archiving of some sorts or aggregation. Um, perimeter control logs, intrusion detection systems, prevention systems, firewalls, etc. cetera. Um, Host-based controls, same deal, AV, firewalls. Um, routine scans, network sweeps, vulnerability scans. And then finally, honeypots, and I'll explain what the value of using uh, a honeypot in conjunction with your other uh, uh, collection methods uh, is. Okay, so what we're looking for are IOCs, or indicators, uh, indicators of compromise. An IOC uh, is a clue left behind that indicates something has happened. It could be anomalous traffic, count activity, resource usage. Uh, when I say resource usage, I mean, you know, you see spikes in the meter there. Uh, something's not right. IOCs are what we want to extract from our data. So we're going to get a mix mash of data, um, and this is specifically what we're looking for. Okay. And in my case, data and event correlation, I use tools, uh, you know, how it's correlated more tools, SIM, um, or security information event management. Some people have used Splunk that I've talked to. I'm not too familiar with it, and I, I know there are limitations in the, the free version. Um, I used OSSIM or Alien Vault. Uh, it's great. It's free. It's easy to set up, and it, uh, it, it's good at parsing a lot of different types of data. It has a lot of plugins, and it actually integrates different uh, threat intelligence feeds. So this is just a basic overview of SAM, security information event management. It collects logs from all over, um, collects different, uh, different forms of log data. It'll perform event dissemination. Um, and you know, you may be thinking, well, we have an NSM program. NSM is more granular. Uh, it's more accurate. Using SIM aims to reduce detection time, but it, again, it's, it's not as accurate. Okay, so how do we increase accuracy? Uh, the same way the big dogs do it, but we have to put in all the work. So, honeypots. Very basic. I'm sure most people in here know what a honeypot is, but I'll give a little uh, background. What is a honeypot? Types of honeypots, high interaction versus low interaction, and everything in between. Uh, 
where this goes wrong, which are common pitfalls, and then considerations for implementation. So very generically here, uh, what's a honeypot? SANS Institute design, uh, defines honeypot systems are decoy servers or systems set up to gather information regarding an attacker or intruder into your system. So it's uh, a, a system that's knowingly deployed to be targeted or, or compromised in some way. And then before going any further, I just wanted to uh, talk about some common problems. Maybe you can you know, decipher um, why certain classifications of honeypots have more value in, uh, in, in a threat intelligence program because of them. Uh, a lot of the time, people say they don't collect anything useful. More often than not, we collect data but never analyze it, which can't help you there. Um, you know, you're not getting any value out of any, any of the work you put in if you're not going to actually look. Uh, and then you're not allowed to deploy them. Um, and you can't deploy them for either legal reasons or your organization is not willing to accept the risk that's associated with uh, having honeypots. So low interaction honeypots emulate specific services. Uh, partial service implementation means there's no interaction. They just collect data. They can pull down files or actually receive files. Uh, typically used for malware collection. Nepenthes, very old. It's an example of just a, a, a malware collection honeypot. Uh, Diania, I'm hoping I, I'm saying that right. I've been calling it that for years, and I don't know how you say it. Um, yeah, so those are just two examples of some low interaction honeypots that are designed specifically for malware collection. Uh, they're both a real pain in the ass to set up, but there is a, a, an OVA that you could download called Honey Drive that's pretty much like an out of the box packaged up bundle of different honeypots that you can quickly deploy and play around with. Um, and then some honey, low interaction honeypots are used for uh, tar pitting, which is impeding malicious activity. Labry is an example of a, of a low interaction uh, honeypot tar pit, uh, and that's to reduce or, or mitigate spam. Medium interaction honeypots. They emulate services to provide a level of interaction to the att attacker. Um, it might be like a shell, uh, but there's no, there's some system interaction more just service related, but it's not like a full system compromise. There's a very limited scope. Uh, Kippo is a widely used SSH honeypot, uh, and there is no exploitation of this system or honeypot whatsoever. Um, if you're interested in learning more about Kippo, I'm just going to cut myself off here. Uh, at ShmooCon this year, Andrew Morris did a talk on balling on a budget where he deployed Kippo honeypots like all over the place. And he was tracking all kinds of like whacked out activity coming from China. And it's really interesting. If you have time, definitely check it out. But um, yeah, he, he deployed Kippo. And it's a, it's a really good introduction to it and what you could do with it. And then finally, high interaction honeypots. Um, they collect the most data, which is what we want. Um, it provides full system interaction. Essentially, it's a full system that's knowingly deployed to be compromised. Um, it requires more maintenance because it's another asset on your network that you have to, you know, maintain. Uh, and it is exploitable, which is the key differentiator here. So, threat intelligence, honey, here. Um, the reality is that all classifications provide some value as they relate to threat intelligence. Um, I personally chose high interaction honeypots because I felt that they worked better for what we were doing. Um, the more data that you collect from your honeypots, the more confidence you could build uh, that a threat exists. And also, the more data that you collect, uh, the more accurate the correlation will be. OK, so why high interaction honeypots for threat intelligence? Simply, we can learn what the bad guys may be after. We can learn how they are doing it, identify what the threats are, uh, and identify the threat actors, hopefully. And that does require additional uh, data sources as well, not just network level threat intelligence. OK, well, isn't that the point of honeypots in general? Uh, yeah, I'm sure you're all like, OK, snooze fest. Um, he just explained to me something that I already know about different types of honeypots and what they're designed to do. Uh, yeah, but it's how you go about it. And why high interaction honeypots have a little more value to them is because they offer many indicators of compromise. 
um, user account anomalies. You can do that with, uh, with a honeypot like Kippo, um, but not necessarily behavioral anomalies. Um, logins would be an example, like failed login attempts or brute force attempts. System changes, uh, file integrity, registry changes, uh, out of place data. So a lot of the times, uh, we actually have caught this. Um, you'll see like a, a file that's just like filling up like random data. It's like completely out of place. And it was actually a, a staging location for exfiltration. Okay. So why not low or medium interaction? Um, in the context of network threat intelligence, the capabilities are limited. Um, and like I said before, they do provide value. There's just a little more value with high interaction honeypots. Uh, medium interaction honeypots do provide value, but don't offer as many indicators of compromise. The same goes for low interaction. Um, low interaction honeypots are, are very obvious and provide little value. Um, I could see value in it if you were to deploy or implement some kind of low interaction honeypots for the sole purpose of uh, you know, capturing malware on your network. Um, but in terms of, you know, more accurate threat intelligence, I don't, I don't think it really benefits you. Making it count, um, your honeypot should mimic production assets. It should look legit. Um, don't separate the honeypot data from production or operational data. Uh, this is something that a couple of people have told me. Uh, they actually, they have honeypots, they use them, but they, they, actually analyze that data separate from everything else that they have. So there's there's no correlation between what's happening on their production network and what's being captured on their honeypot. So there's really, you're, you're really losing value there by not doing that. And then of course, uh, being proactive. Uh, if you're not looking into the things that you're capturing or if you're not monitoring the activity, then you're, there, there's no point. So again, they must look legit. You might just want to flip around the, the colors of the clothing there. It'll look good, but anyway. Adding production value. Um, why deploy into production and mimic production assets? Um, very straightforward, because the attackers that matter are not stupid. Um, they're going to see things. They're going to see a system on your network that's running like a, a million different ports, and they're going to know something's up or that you didn't care enough to, to, to lock up the box. Um, if that's the case, they're not going to waste their time. Um, we know that anything that touches these boxes is bad. That goes without saying. They're specifically designed to be compromised. There is there is no reason that someone that's doing an honest job is going to uh, try to use any of these services running on your honeypots. Your honeypots will not deter an attacker uh, from other assets, in most cases, that's what I found. Um, it'll just provide more surface area and act as an early mechanism of detection. Um, so it might tie them up for a little bit, but they're still going to explore the rest of your of your network. Uh, that's just the reality of it. Um, high interaction honeypot considerations. Um, so I did a lot of research on how to make sure that I don't get in trouble for what I do with the honeypots or how they could get me in trouble. Um, you want to filter ingress and egress traffic to prevent your honeypot from being leveraged in another attack. It would really be a shame if you were held liable for your honeypot committing a crime. Um, legal, you want to add warning banners. You know, this is to be accessed by authorized personnel only. We reserve the right for blah, 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 blah. Definitely have legal team review it. Um, People don't do that. I know you can get in some trouble for that. Uh, and then policy-based routing. So route the gnome bad to your high interaction honeypots. Um, if you're running, unless you're running hidden services, I really don't see why you would allow Tor traffic to go to anything that has value. Um, but you may want to analyze exactly what it is that they're doing. Uh, you can get a list of exit nodes and you could create a policy that would route all of that traffic directly to your honey, uh, your high interaction honeypots. Um, the same thing goes for geography. If you're a regional bank, um, there's no reason for someone in India or China or Russia to be accessing um, services for regional bank in Massachusetts. It's just, it's not normal. But you may want to collect some kind of information from that activity. 
Okay, so considerations with virtualization, uh, available resources. I have to say it's quite it's quite obvious. Um, do you have hardware available? Uh, do you have finances available? It's supposed to eliminate cost, but um, for my second point here, virtual machine escape, it's, it's a legit issue. Um, always put your honeypots on non-production hardware. So yes, I don't want to contradict myself. Put them in your production environment, but um, put them on something that you're okay with being tampered with. If the whole box was was compromised, then who cares? As long as there's nothing valuable on there, at the very least, it's doing your due diligence. Cloud considerations, uh, your provider most likely doesn't allow this. Um, I can very clearly tell you that your provider doesn't allow this. Um, they don't want you to deploy any kind of high interaction honeypot that's designed to be exploited uh, because it's gonna put their users and, and their assets at risk. Uh, if they don't explicitly state it, you still wouldn't want to deploy high interaction honeypots just in case. Um, like I mentioned, Andrew Morris's talk before, he was setting up uh, Kippo honeypots, which are medium interaction. Um, there's a very big limitation as to what the attacker could do, but it's a good source of, of data collection. Um, so, I mean, I would say it's safe, but again, don't take my advice. Uh, and it could be expensive. Um, you know, cloud services, purchasing servers, it's a numbers game when it comes to collecting data and with honeypots in general, so uh, it, it could be expensive in, an expensive investment to set all these up. Okay, so where this all goes wrong, um, the wrong honeypots are deployed in the wrong places. Um, you might have you might put, like I said before, high interaction honeypot out in the cloud when it might be more conducive with your threat intelligence program that you've developed to put a uh, low or medium interaction honeypot out there. Um, you wouldn't want to put something in your DMZ that didn't belong there. Um, you didn't consult legal or take preventative action to ensure that your honeypots don't commit a crime. Again, you know, read up on what you are and aren't allowed to do. And at the end of the day, as long as you consult legal, you're pretty much saving your own ass. Um, and you set it up and leave it on autopilot. I know this doesn't just pertain to um, threat intelligence data collection. Uh, a lot of people buy products out there and they just stick them on their network and like, okay, we got it. Um, yeah, if you just leave it alone and neglect it, something is eventually going to happen. Uh, again, exercise due diligence, um, revisit your honey pots, uh, image them occasionally, so forth. Yeah. All right. This next little section here is going to be about canaries, what a canary is. Um, so think of a canary like a canary in a coal mine. Uh, canary would breathe in toxic gas, so it's like carbon monoxide, and drop dead. And it would be like an early warning sign to the miners that um, they need to get the hell out of there or they're going to be next. So very plainly, a canary is deception-based detection. It's making something look juicy that's going to um, attract uh, a, an intruder, um, and it's also going to provide some kind of indication of compromise. So some examples of canaries, um, dummy data I to identify exfiltration attempts on specific files, um, I read an article somewhere on the SANS blog about uh, metadata and attributing just a random string um, in that, in like a, like a PDF, something that looked pretty juicy, um, and then setting up uh, an IDS signature that would alert upon that file, like being transferred over the network. And I've tested it. I haven't really seen anything, uh, you know, grab it. It works. It's actually really interesting, and I'd like to see it trigger an alert. Um, but I thought that was a, a really creative approach. Uh, dummy users create user accounts that are specifically designed to trigger an alert. So if John Doe doesn't work at your company and, uh, you know, clearly there are login attempts with that name or that username, um, then you know that the, the attacker has harvested credentials from one of your honeypots. Um, and that would be, an, again, another indicator that something is, is not right. Um, 
I just had to throw this in there, a uh, market watch. Commercial honeypot based products are now hitting the market hard. Um, I've seen this product called Canary, which is, uh, it's, it's actually designed by a South African based company, security company, and it is, I believe, a high interaction honeypot that you would stick on your network. Uh, Ativo Networks, now their product is really, really, uh, interesting. It is a, it's an appliance that sits on your network and it uses up your unused IP space and it actually emulates services on all these un unused IPs uh, to collect network intelligence data. And then Honeybox, which I believe is, it's, it might be kind of old, but I know that that one, I, somebody was talking about it recently, I believe that's also a high interaction honeypot. Uh, and again, it's, it's a single appliance that you pop on your network and yeah. Okay, so just a recap of what I've gone over. Um, threat intelligence, what it is. It's the collection of data, uh, and it's the sum of data and analysis. Where it comes from, the different sources it could come from uh, internal, come from your network, it could come from uh, the internet, or uh, from open source lists. Honeypots, what a honeypot is, the different types, uh, low, medium, high interaction, and the implications of all pitfalls and considerations with virtualization, um, cloud, and then again, implementation, and why use high, uh, high interaction honeypots for threat intelligence. Okay, so high interaction honeypots provide the most value in regard to data collection for threat intelligence. Probably heard from other sources as well, your honeypot should look legit. The more you collect, the more confidence you build in your intelligence. Okay, and this I threw in there because um, this is actually what I would like to do. I mean, it gets pretty boring working with the same data over and over again, and if you want a more comprehensive program, uh, you need to start extending into other sources. So building on top of the network threat intelligence data and expanding into other sources, such as maybe setting up some legit honeypots out in the cloud, um, and also uh, correlating that information with my network information and some open source feeds, uh, I think that would I know it would greatly improve the program that I've created. This is something my boss used to tell me. Uh, there's a huge amount of shit out there and we all need to pick up a shovel. So again, I'm not an expert in this space whatsoever. Uh, I just wanted to learn. Um, and sometimes you have to get your hands dirty. It's not necessarily given to you in the form of a product. Um, so if that's the case, don't be afraid to try things, make mistakes. Making mistakes is the best way to do it. Um, and yeah. Great learning experience overall. Just gonna go over some references here. Um, the HoneyNet project, they have a lot of great tools on their site, a lot of them poorly documented um, and kind of old. But um, GitHub does have a lot of the newer tools created by some of their members. Uh, and there's a lot of really good stuff out there that is better documented. Um, the Tripwire blog, Tripwire has a blog called State of Security, uh, and there's a Cyber Threat Intelligence series, which is awesome. It's a great primer, and it goes a little deeper. It tells you about practical application um, of threat intelligence and the different types of data feeds and where you can get it and what you could do with it. Um, so it is very, very interesting, and if you did want to explore that area a little more, I highly recommend that. Uh, and then a book, Virtual Honeypots from Botnet Tracking to Intrusion Detection by Niels Provost and Thorsten Hulls. Um, it's a fairly old book, and a lot of the information in there is, uh, or the, the tools that they use rather, are fairly old, but the concepts are really good, and there's a lot of legitimate information in there that um, if you did want to explore further with honeypots or just experiment, um, it's worth checking out. It's an easy read. Okay, and then I had to mention these people, and I know DA is here. Uh, he, yep. That's you, really? Get out of here, man. I didn't even know what you looked like. I was like, I, I would have attended your training yesterday, had my plane. An amorphous pink love would be a human being. Really? Oh, man. <laughs> I, I'm telling you, you provide entertainment to me all day long. So I was going to tell you, follow him. It's the most entertaining um, Twitter account to follow. And I am very sorry that I did not make it to your training session yesterday. My, like, like I was saying, my plane was canceled really, really early in the morning, and they're like, okay, we can't do anything for you until three o'clock. Three o'clock rolls around, another hour, and yeah, so forth, so. But anyway, next time.
Uh, Andrew Morris, very cool. Again, that's the gentleman I mentioned who spoke at ShmooCon. Uh, he's doing some really cool stuff, and I feel like we're all flipping sides here. Everybody who's a pen tester is like, oh, I want to get in on this, you know, intelligent shit. Um, and he's, I believe he works for what? Intrepidus Group? I think you know who he is. Okay, very cool. But he's an interesting character. He created um, a cool, God, a Twitter bot. It was cool. I think it's called ThreatBot. And you can, like, yeah, what? Send, uh, yeah. Animus Project. Animus Project. Yeah, you can actually tweet IPs at it, and it'll tell you if it's been, you know, if that data has been collected from somewhere or if, it, uh, if it's malicious. It's, it's really interesting. Uh, and then I had to throw Alien Vault on there because they've actually been pretty helpful. Um, their team has been very supportive. Conrad, Constantine, the marketing people. You'd be shocked how much the marketing people know about their product. Um, uh, they have some really good posts, a lot of good training materials. Um, and like I said, I used OSSIM as my SIM platform to do uh, correlation and dissemination. Um, very good stuff. It's all free. Every time you watch one of their little uh, the little videos, though, they do like to plug the marketing information in there, but it's 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 good. Um, and there are many more to list, so don't feel bad if I didn't mention you in here. I'm more of a lurker on Twitter. I like following everybody. It, it, like I said, it's my entertainment. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Sorry if that was a little quick. Cool. <laughs> hey, man, sometimes that could be a good thing. <laughs>